Well, good morning. And good morning to our Quivira audience. Is a audience, Quivira congregation, as you join us through the Psalmcast. <laughs> Uh, you know, this has been a great week for me. I don't know uh, if many of you have heard of this organization, but there's a, there's a group of mission organizations that have come together worldwide. <clears throat> People like the International Mission Board with the Southern Baptists and, and Campus Crusade and Wycliffe uh, Bible Translators and a number of other large mission organizations have come together to create what's called uh, the Issachar Initiative. And it is an initiative to reach the 4,000 remaining people groups by the year 2025. It's a very ambitious endeavor, and I was part of, of that uh, summit that met this week here in Kansas City. And I was very, very moved by this possibility that within our lifetime, for some of us anyways, that we might see the Great Commission be completed. And it's happening, and it's, there's a tremendous movement that's happening all around the world. Uh, one of the statistics that was staggering to me that I heard this weekend is this. That uh, this came from an African uh, Muslim convert who now is uh, committed to reaching uh, the Muslim uh, nations in Africa with the gospel. And he has suffered greatly as a result of that, has many of people who have been working with him. In fact, he said that in the past six years, just within his ministry of reaching those countries, there have been 64 martyrs of the faith, those who have been slain, um, sometimes in a horrific fashion on video, for the sake of simply proclaiming the gospel. He said, in every case, the average number of churches that sprout up in the place where the martyr died was 27. 27 churches on the average sprout up in the place where the missionary is slain simply to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're back into the first century. That's what that looks like. This is how the church grew and developed in, in the first and second century, third century, was, was by people willing to give their entire life to simply proclaim Jesus as Lord in places where it had never been heard. That is a powerful thing for us to remember as we come into this season of Thanksgiving, isn't it? That we gather here today totally unencumbered, unhindered by the thought of persecution or execution. And yet all over the world today, there are people who are willing to give up their lives simply to say that Jesus is Lord. As you gather around that turkey this week, would you say a prayer for them? Would you pray for the persecuted church? Would you pray for the Great Commission to be accomplished in our lifetime? I think the leadership of our church will come back to you with what Colonial's role might be in just doing our small part in that. But uh, this is a powerful thought as we come to worship today. One of the reasons we have hope even in those kind of staggering stories. One of the reasons we have hope as we come into this season of Thanksgiving is that we can pray, we can talk to God, and we know that God hears our prayer and he answers our prayer. For the past seven weeks, we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer as given to us, taught to us by Jesus himself in Luke 11. He knows, though, that we are people of weak faith, that our inclination is to doubt that God hears us or that God is even going to answer our prayer. So he follows his teaching on how to pray and what to pray for with a reason why we should pray. Two illustrations and a promise. And that's where we're at today in Luke. If you turn to the 11th chapter of Luke, we'll be reading verses 5 through 13. If you would, please stand for the reading of God's word. We'll put the words on the screen if you don't have your Bibles with you. Let's read together. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me, the door is already locked and my children are in bed with me. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is a friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? 
Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Please be seated. Lord, we take you at your word. We read these words and we understand that it was the Son of God who spoke them, the Messiah, the fulfillment of hundreds of prophecies, the one who validated his words by being publicly executed and raised on the third day as testified by hundreds. Many who were willing to go to their death, even to this day in countries all over this world, willing to go to their death simply to say, he's not dead, he's alive. He has risen. He is the Lord, the Lamb of God, our Savior, our only forgiveness of sins. This is the one who told us how to pray, what to pray for, and gave us an assurance that you hear our prayers and that you provide for us, that you answer. Help us to believe. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, prior to 9-11, I don't suspect that many of us sat around wondering what the condition of women in Afghanistan was. I know I didn't. But after 9-11, when the Americans, along with other countries, invaded Afghanistan to pick a fight with the Taliban and fight back against their attacks against America from 9-11, we began to hear stories coming back from Afghanistan about the terrible condition of women uh, as they were being oppressed by the Taliban to the degree that they, one example, they weren't even allowed to be educated at all. And this was an outrage for many, many people who felt deeply for this group of women in Afghanistan. And so you may remember, and this may still be happening, I'm not sure, but around 2003, 2004, many Americans were opening up their homes to welcome young Afghanistan uh, Afghanistani women into their homes where they could heal up, where they could go to school and get an education and find some hope for themselves and then, you know, go back. Well, I was in Hilton Head Island in, in 2004 working as an associate pastor at a church there and one of the families in our church adopted, uh, you know, four of those young ladies or not, they hosted them for, for several months in their home. And because they were Christians and, and churchgoers, they would bring these young a Muslim Afghanistan women to church with them. And so I got to know them. And, and you can imagine me with four 20-something Afghanistan Muslim women. You know, I mean, I was annoying. I asked them so many questions. And they delighted in my interest in their country and their culture and even in their religion. And in one case, after we had been together with a group of believers and the Muslim girls were with us, uh, I had finished praying and, and I asked them, I said, now tell me, what are your observations about you know, American Christianity as it compares to the practice of religion in your country. And they said, you know, one of the most interesting things for us, one of the most intriguing things is the way that you pray. You pray with a familiarity and an ease and, uh, and just very plain words when you talk to God. And I said, well, why, why is that different? And they said, well, in Islam, we, we are taught to pray all of our prayers uh, in Arabic. And we pray the same prayer all the time, several times a day. But the reality is, is that almost all Muslims in the world, most of them anyways, don't speak Arabic. And so we say these prayers all the time, but we don't know what we're saying. Now this is the case for probably the majority of Muslims around the world, that they say these prayers in Arabic out of duty and tradition every day. They're very faithful in saying these prayers, but there's no use of the common language, no personal connection with God, and very little expectation that they'll hear back from God. One of our members uh, here at Colonial actually grew up in Iran and uh, is now a Christian, but he was telling me one day about this very thing, that for years in Iran, he and his family would say the, the daily prayers in Arabic, but they spoke Farsi, or, and it was just one of those situations where we don't know what we're saying. So he went to his father and said, Father, what are we saying when we say these words in Arabic? Father, oh, you don't need to ask that. Just, just say your prayers, you know. Well, finally, after several years, the father finally admitted he didn't know what the words were. Nor did his father, nor did his grandfather. They had just always said these prayers in Arabic at these times of the day. They felt that it was 
expected and it was duty and it was part of their tradition, but they did not know what they were saying. Now, you might be surprised to learn that in the first century Jewish context that Jesus is in, the, the New Testament is written, that many Jews were in the same situation. The prayers were traditional prayers. They were said in Hebrew, but many of the Jews, especially the poor ones, didn't know how to speak Hebrew. They didn't know what they were saying. They spoke Aramaic as a result of their long time of bondage uh, in exile in Babylon. And so they would say their prayers. They would say them often, but probably in the context that Jesus is teaching here, a lot of these faithful Jews would have to admit we're not really sure what we say, or they're not sure of everything that they're saying, or they didn't feel permission to pray in a different language. So what we see then is that Jesus it just astonishes the disciples by praying in a completely different way. He prays in the common language. Sometimes he prays out loud, sometimes he prays silently, sometimes he prays all night long. And then as a result of his time in prayer, he'll suddenly have this profound statement or he'll, he'll choose his uh, 12 apostles or he will make a prediction about his death as though in the season of prayer that he just came out of, God spoke to him and gave him insights and gave him confidence, courage, and power. So as we've seen here at the early part of chapter 11, Jesus is again praying and the disciples are looking at him and one of them just comes out and says, can you teach us to pray? And it's not, can you teach us about prayer? It's, can you teach us to pray the way that you pray? Because none of us pray that way. And Jesus says, I'll teach you how to pray. He te teaches them what to ask for, how to approach the Father when we pray. And of course, we've looked at that for seven weeks here this fall. But then Jesus follows up with the teaching on prayer. It says, when you pray, pray like this, say these words, kind of, you know, say generally this thing to God, approach him this way. But then he addresses our deep fear even as followers of Christ, that maybe God doesn't hear our prayer. Maybe God is not pleased with our prayer. Maybe God will not answer our prayer. And he gives us this assurance with two illustrations and a promise. And the promise is stuck right in the middle of the two illustrations. So I want to look at the two illustrations, then we'll come and focus on the promise. He begins by saying this. And, and, and this first illustration is just called a friend at midnight. And, and before I get into it, I just want to acknowledge the elephant in the room. And here it is. It's that for most of us who've read the Bible or from, we're familiar with the Gospel of Luke, we've heard the story of, you know, the man who goes to his neighbor in the middle of the night, says, hey, give me some bread, I've got a visitor, and the man says, go away, leave me alone. But because of the man's boldness and his persistence, the man finally gets up and gives us bread. And we've, for years, we thought, well, you know, here, here's the lesson. If we badger God enough, he'll answer our prayer even if he doesn't want to. He'll get generally annoyed with us and just give us what we want if we just keep badgering him. I am pretty sure that is not the meaning of this story. But many of us kind of have always thought that way. So let me show you what I, I think is true to the text, and, and I think it will make a lot of sense to you. All right, Jesus is in these two illustrations, both the, you know, the friend at midnight and then the, the, the illustration of a father, a loving father. He's going to set up two completely absurd scenarios. And they're so clearly absurd that everybody who's standing there saying this is like the most absurd thing. A son asks, you know, for a fish and give him a snake. That's absurd. Never happened, right? This is a never happened scenario that he's painting for you. It's just a little harder for us to understand it in our culture. So he says this. He says, within his ancient Middle Eastern audience, he says, can you imagine? Picture a friend. Suppose you had this kind of a friend, that one of you would go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children are in bed with me. I can't get up and give you anything. This is a rhetorical question. This is an outlandish, absurd picture that would never, ever happen in the ancient world. How do we know this? Dr. Ken Bailey, again, one of my favorite New Testament scholars, lived in the Middle East for 25, 30 years, gives tremendous historical and contextual insight into this story. When the visitor arrives in this ancient Middle Eastern culture, there is a Everyone knows how it works. There is a tradition, a time-honored tradition that everyone knows about. First of all, when the guest arrives, he is to receive one loaf of unbroken bread, unless the loaves are very small, and then it'll be three. 
This is the tradition. What this man comes to ask for, everybody understands this. But you don't understand it, so let me explain it to you. Why an unbroken loaf? Why is that a big deal? Why can't he have a, a half loaf or a broken loaf? Okay. In the ancient Middle Eastern culture, you have to understand that the bread served as the fork, the spoon, and the meal all at the same time. And it's still like that if you go for hors d'oeuvres at Applebee's with the spinach artichoke dip, right? <laughs> they bring in the bowl of dip, they bring you the bread, you tear off a piece of bread, you dip it in the dip, and you eat it, right? This, this is what happened in, in that traditional setting. There would be multiple bowls of kind of a, of a dip, of a, of a sauce, or some kind of a, a, a paste, and you would receive your unbroken loaf of bread, and that would be your silverware. That would also be the means by which you eat your stuff. So you tear off a piece, you dip it in a bowl. Everyone's dipping in the same bowls, but everyone's tearing off a piece of their own bread. If you came to my house and I offered you broken bread, it would like be offering you dirty silverware. I mean, it would be completely offensive. And so clearly, this man doesn't have any unbroken bread. Why? Well, because they didn't bake bread before nighttime. Why not? Well, because not everybody had a stove. We know from excavations that in the Middle Eastern peasant kind of communities, there would be a shared outdoor stove. And each family would rotate stove privileges. So clearly in this case, when the visitor shows up, this family, who's going to play host, did not have stove privileges that late afternoon, but they know who did. You would always know who baked bread that day. And it would be very normal for him to recognize that he doesn't have the fresh bread, but his neighbor's two doors down does, and he goes to his neighbor and says, I have unexpected company, I need some fresh bread, and I know that you bake bread today because we didn't have stove privileges, you did. Now, you're thinking, yeah, but how does that work? Okay, you have to understand something. Within the ancient village, within this community, it was a great privilege to host a guest. Anybody's guest. And it was everybody's job to host a guest. It wasn't just the host family, it was the whole village. In fact, this was a matter of great honor. Your honor was at stake in the way that you demonstrated hospitality to guests. Not just for the host family, the whole honor of the village is at stake if this person does not receive the adequate traditional hospitality of the unbroken bread and a, and a, and a good meal when he shows up any time of day or night. And of course, you have to remember, in the ancient world, people traveled at night. Why? Because it was hot. You traveled at night to get out of the sun. So this would not be a totally unusual situation for travelers to show up at midnight. You have to imagine the average peasant home, according to Gary Burge, in the, uh, the Middle Eastern storyteller, he says the average peasant home consisted of one small room with an elevated porch near the back. The entire family would commonly sleep together on this porch while their possessions and animals would actually be right there in the dwelling with them in the front. So here's the picture that Jesus is painting. He's saying the host family has been awakened by the arrival of an unexpected guest. The long-standing tradition of hospitality immediately kicks in, and this host is not annoyed that this guest would show up at midnight. He's excited. This is an opportunity to, to receive honor and to extend honor. He, he's excited about this opportunity to be a host and demonstrate hospitality. When he discovers that he does not have the necessary supplies to provide the prerequisite meal, he doesn't panic. He knows that he can go to his neighbor within the village and ask for fresh bread from the person who baked bread that day. So the host walks over to the neighbor, who is a friend, and he calls out, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Now, everyone within earshot of Jesus knows how this plays out in their village. <laughs> it's a gimme. The man will get up, he'll step over his kids, he'll tell them to get up and get out of the way, and they'll light a lamp, and they'll get the bread, and it will be with great pride and honor that he provides the bread for the unexpected guest two doors down. Everybody knows that. Jesus says, though, can you imagine a friend who would respond, don't bother me? And the clear answer to this question is, no way. That's absurd. It would never happen. Why? Because honor is at stake. Jesus says, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him bread because he is his friend, yet because of his idea, 
he will get up and give him all that he needs. Now you're saying, what, um, what is that word? It's in the Greek. I'm going to explain it to you. But notice his idea. This is the crux of this passage and of this whole story. Now there are two mysteries. Who is the his and what does idea mean? Traditionally, and the NIV has interpreted this for you, and I think wrongly, they've interpreted the his to be the one who's asking for bread, the host family. But his could, could actually apply to either the one who's asking for the bread or the one who's asleep and is considering whether he's going to answer this request or not, right? It's just his. We don't know who the his is. Bailey, Ken Bailey, and, uh, and Dr. Burge agree that Anida belongs to the sleeper not the host, the person who's in bed with his children. It's his Anida. Because of his Anida, he will get up and give the man who's asking all that he needs. Now, this has been the traditional translation because of the man's boldness. But Anida never means boldness or persistence anywhere in any Greek literature. It's because biblical translators have just been so frustrated by how does this work in prayer? Why do... Let me, let me explain to you. Anida is, is a prefix with a root. The root, Ida, is shame. That's what it means. Always means that. An, A-N, is the negation of whatever comes before it. So the literal reading of this is, because of his anti-shame, the man will get up and give him as much as he needs. Because of his horror at the thought of shame because of his honor. This man will get up and give as much as is needed. Here's the point. You see, you have to remember, this is a culture of shame and honor. It still is a culture of shame and honor if you go to the Middle East. And this shame and honor is not just personal, it's communal. It's for the whole village. The whole village is going to share in the shame or the honor. So because of his anti-shame, because of his, his hatred of shame and his hope for honor, this man will get up, he'll wake up his kids, and he'll provide the bread. It doesn't matter whether he doesn't like you or not. It doesn't matter whether you're friends or not. It doesn't matter that it's at midnight. It doesn't matter what formula you approach and ask for the bread. Because of the man's honor, he will give the bread. And this is the point of this illustration. The assumed lesson that Jesus is teaching, and we can get this from the second illustration, is this. If you can count on your sinful neighbors to respond to your request because of their honor, how much more will God hear and answer your prayers because of his honor, which is far more powerful and pure and perfect and holy and just than your best neighbor? Second illustration, similar point much easier to understand in our culture. Jesus says in verse 11, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if, if, if he asks you for an egg, you'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And this is a very simple illustration, and it's very clear, isn't it? I mean, we as parents, we love our kids. And we fully intend to provide for them when, whenever they have a need. So our little kid comes up to us and says, Papa, give me some dinner. You say, go feed yourself. No. You say, here, eat this poisonous thing. Eat this terrible thing. No. You're not irritated that your child asks you for dinner? This is just what we do. We're parents. We love our children. Of course we're going to provide for them dinner. We, we delight in their requests, and we delight in providing for them what they need. It's that simple. Jesus says, when you pray, call God, Papa, Daddy, and ask him. Trusting that he delights in your request, and he will give you exactly what you need out of his deep love for you because of his honor because of who he is, not based upon the formula by which you asked him or the language by which you asked him or because you've been really good this week. God hears and answers prayer because of who God is and how God is. It's not based upon the way we ask or how we've been or whether we're buddies. 
God's love is similar to the love that you have for your children, except your love for your children is always tainted by just a hint of evil or sin or selfishness. God's love, never. It's a pure love. It's a billion times more pure than our love for our own children. That is powerful. Now, here's the point, and it's nestled right between these two great, perfect illustrations. Look at verses 9 and, 11, uh, 9 and 10. Jesus says, So I say to you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, these words should bring you profound comfort and joy when you pray. Why? Because Jesus has said in no uncertain terms that these illustrations and this promise that God can be approached with confidence and assurance that he hears our prayers and that he delights in answering our prayer. And that you don't have to worry that you haven't asked in the right way or in the right language or that you've come to him at a bad time. God answers prayers. If we ask, it will be given to us. If we seek, we will find what we're looking for. If we knock, the door will be swung wide open. But what does God give us when we ask? What does he delight to give us? You know, most of us, when we're praying, we're praying for God's stuff. God says, I'm gonna do better than that. I'm gonna give you myself. That's what Jesus says. God delights in giving us himself in his Holy Spirit. And this, if you have any spiritual awareness, is a great promise that should bring you ultimate joy and hope in any circumstance. Because if God is with us, who then can stand against us? Romans 8, 31, this was the great, powerful statement that Paul made. If God is with us, who can stand against us? Jesus said, ask me, and I will give you me. If God is with you, if the Holy Spirit is with you, you can stand. You will overcome. You will survive. You will persevere. You will finish the race. You will accomplish the mission. This is our great promise, Luke eleven thirteen. 13. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, some of you are thinking, I suspect, I don't buy it. I don't buy any of it. And I'll tell you why. Because my wife had cancer and I prayed that God would heal her and she died anyways. My child has been sick and I've been praying that the Lord would heal my child and he's still sick. I've been unemployed for two years. I've been praying that God would open a door for me to get a job and the door keeps slamming shut. I don't buy it. I prayed to God. And he didn't deliver. It's a legitimate complaint. You have every right to feel the way that you do. So let's just think about that for a minute. There are really only two possible answers to your complaint. The first is that Jesus is lying and the Bible can't be trusted. And the second is that God did answer your prayer, but not in the way that you desired. Now your first option would be hard to defend in any examination of history. For all throughout the past 2,000 years, millions and millions of people who have lived in terrible circumstances, have lived to tell the story or have even died to tell the story that God answers prayers in powerful ways, that God provides, that he is good all the time, all over the world. For 2,000 years, that has been the testimony. It would be hard to build a case based upon Jesus' character and what he said, that he was lying. So let's consider the other possibility, that God heard your prayer and he answered the prayer. And it is just not the answer that you wanted. That is a possibility. When we look to the natural, we see that very possibility exists in our relationship with our own kids. It's one thing for my child to come up and say, Daddy, feed me supper. It's another thing for him to dictate the menu. <laughs> I am very prepared and honored and glad, and it is my role, and I take great honor in providing for my children. But if they dictate their supper is to be M&Ms and Pepsi, <laughs> they're probably going to be disappointed. I will give them what they need, but I will not always give them what they want. That would not be loving. On some occasions, the meal that I set before them is not what they have in mind, and every once in a while, they refuse to eat what I have served them, and they will go on to be very hungry and complain that they've had no dinner. But it's not because I failed to provide food, it's because they failed to eat what I had prepared. 
Now, I know that sounds maybe simplistic and maybe a bit callous to your complaint and your circumstances. But let's, let's acknowledge that at the end of the day, it truly does come down to this. I mean, either God is your loving Father who loves and provides for you perfectly according to his infinite wisdom and your ultimate benefit, or God is not at all loving and delights in disappointing you. Jesus said, ask him. Approach him with confidence and assurance. Call him Papa and rest assured that even more than your neighbor who is consumed with honor and wanting to do the right thing, even more than the most loving father, your father in heaven hears your prayer and answers your prayer perfectly every time. He loves you that much. That's either true or it's not. If it's true, then it's true for all time in all circumstances in the life of a believer. Now let's not forget, this entire thought unit in Luke 11 is directed to those that Jesus assumes, Jesus knows, he's talking to those who are followers of Jesus. This instruction on prayer, the illustrations and the promises are given to those who have submitted themselves to the Lordship of Christ, to those who have been adopted as children of God through the forgiveness of sins. They are followers of Jesus. You see, when you submit yourself to the king and you serve in his kingdom, you benefit from his kingdom. When you've been adopted into the family of God, you benefit from the care and the provision of your father. Dallas Willard says it this way, divine conspiracy. Listen, he says this, the provisions Jesus made for his people during this period in which we now live are provisions made for those who are precisely apprentices to him in kingdom living. Anyone who is not a continual student of Jesus and who nevertheless reads the great promises of the Bible as if they were for him or her is like someone trying to cash a check on another person's account. This is why Jesus has always said and continues to say to people in dreams and visions and unreached people groups, he continues to show up throughout history and say, follow me. You see, it's in the following that we come to know and trust our master, that we recognize his voice. It is in the following that we learn to receive what the father provides as good, even if it's not what we hope for. It is in the following over months and years that we come to see the wisdom and the brilliance and the mercy and the grace, the perfect love of our Heavenly Father who does not always give us what we want, but he provides perfectly what we need, who always reveals what it is that we're looking for at exactly the right moment, who swings the door open, the perfect door, at the exact right time. It is in the following that we come to recognize that he is with us, that he is for us, that his Holy Spirit is all we need. It is enough, empowering us and providing for us as we pray and bring our requests before God. You know what, as you gather this week over Thanksgiving or in the weeks ahead, I'm gonna challenge you to do something. Go and find a seasoned saint. We've got some in our church. Go ask people who have lived longer, who suffered more, and who have kept their faith. Ask them to tell you a story of how God provides. And then sit back for about three or four hours. Because they have a lot. You need a little mileage. You need a little time of being in this following relationship with Jesus before you begin to see he's been with me all along. His answers to my prayer have been perfect. He has never not answered my prayer. There have been times I didn't like it, but now looking back, I understand it was perfect. It was loving. Are you following Jesus Christ? The promises of Scripture are devoted and given to those who have taken a knee before the King. And if you haven't taken a knee, I would invite you to. Jesus continues to say to you, absolutely you, individually you, collectively you, follow me.
And it begins by seeing what separates us from following him. It's our sin, it's our pride, it's our unforgiveness. It's all these things that the Bible's been talking about. And we just present that before him and say, I haven't followed you. I probably won't follow you left to my own devices. I, I need forgiveness. And you confess your sin and you call upon the name of Jesus Christ because it's his blood that atones for our sin that allows us to be in relationship with God, to be adopted into the family of God, to become subjects in the kingdom of God. And then we are invited to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us and approach the Father with confidence and assurance that he hears our prayer and he answers it perfectly every time. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we recognize that uh, most of the time, instead of asking for supper, we're dictating the menu. That we think that we know what's best. We think that we know what we're entitled to. We're not really asking you, we're telling you. So we repent today and we confess our sin. We, we, we ask that you forgive us again, you reinstate us into your kingdom and that, and that you remind us that you love us, that, that you are always here in our prayers, that you are always responding to our prayers and that you will absolutely provide our daily bread. <laughs> Lord, we believe, help our unbelief. Show us even this day, even this week, how you are perfectly answering our prayers, that our confidence might increase, that we would approach you with, with gratitude and thankfulness and openness to your perfect will being lived out in our lives. Lord, I pray for even one person here today, one person at our Quivera site who has never taken a knee before the king. I pray that you will bring conviction through the power of your Holy Spirit that this person too might become a follower of Christ. It is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.